Welcome back to Too Much Cowboy, a backtrack mini series where I challenged five of the most talented media writers I know to have the most interesting conversation about the least remarkable Star Wars film, Solo, a Star Wars story. This first episode explores the story of how Solo came to be and its tumultuous development, including the departures of its directors and the many onset meddlings of Disney higher ups. It is drama from start to finish. Hey guys, welcome back to Backtrack Behind the Creators. Uh, I'm your host, DC McNeil, author of Maynard Trigg and editor-in-chief at ZeroIndent.com. I am joined today by returning guest, friend of the show, Danielle. What's up, Danielle? Hey guys, thanks for having me back. Wouldn't have it any other way. And of oh. course, Patrick, host of Method to the Madness. We Hello. got him. I don't know how we managed to book him on such short notice, but we got him. Uh, you will address me as the esteemed co-host. Oh, the esteemed yeah. co-host. How does Mitchie <laughs> feel about that? Uh, I haven't told him. Okay, cool. Yeah. This will be an interesting rude awakening for him. I love you, Mitchie. Yeah. Uh, Danielle, of course, from Level Story magazine. Uh, the reason I've summoned you here today, um, kind of kind of Lord of the Rings style, you know, you know, they go to like um, the, what's the place with the elves, Rivendell? Yeah. Yeah, it's the Council of Elves. You guys are like the precursor to the Council of Elves. We're going to talk about one of my favorite films that also sucks a bit um today mm -hmm. uh and we're going to kind of go through the story of how it came to be um the different moving parts that that ultimately resulted in this motion picture um and then next uh, episode in part two we'll be joined by some amazing uh youtube media crit uh friends who have dedicated their lives to thinking and writing about star wars so we'll have them on to kind of help us uh do a deep dive and a beat by beat analysis of uh solo star wars story before like, we kind of get into it, I just wanted to touch base, like, Star Wars-wise, where are we all at? Pat, what, what's, what's your relationship like to Star Wars coming into this? Um, like a lot of kids from my generation, I'm a prequel boy. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know what? Like, I, I love Star Wars. I'm not crazy about it. Like, I'm the kind of guy that when uh, the new Episode Nine came out, or like any of the sequel trilogies, I waited two weeks to go see it. Like, you know, right. if that speaks anything about... You weren't day one. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, that being said, I, I enjoy it. Um, it's a really big part of my childhood, informed the way I love pop culture and movies. And yeah, it's just... Uh, it's a, I mean, you know, overlooking the monopoly that Disney and Star Wars has on culture, <laughs> uh -huh, yeah. I, it's just a good bit of fun. So you like it, but you're not in love yet. Yeah. Yeah, love it. Uh, Danielle? Yeah, so I have to say, I'm I'm not the biggest Star Wars fan. I don't hate it. Like, when I was in college, I, I did feel like I hated it. Um, and my friends basically forced me to watch it. Um, Wait, is this continuing on the train of, like, college Danielle being very high and mighty about everything? Does it fall into that yes. category? Love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, but to be fair, like, I when I was younger, um, like, like, very young, like, around six years old, um at this like after school daycare that my mom would send us to they would watch star wars a lot and i'd always be like i don't want to watch this so it's like i never really wanted to watch it anyway um so maybe that was just like trauma from my younger <laughs> years um star but, wars trauma yeah <laughs> yeah but um, when episode eight came out a friend of mine i was going to visit her in texas and she wanted to see the movie in the theater so i got more into it because i watched episode seven in preparation for eight and uh become a bit like I like the movies now I think they're fine um then I saw episode nine and was like oh I don't know anymore yeah, oh, maybe but they are bad <laughs> I, I think it you know it just depends but I do think they're just kind of they're fun movies um I'll give yeah, them that I don't love them but yeah fun fun good fun uh yeah I, I started before we started making shows and I was just a normal person um, who wasn't completely broken by doing years of media criticism. I kind of liked Star Wars. Like, I, I grew up um, kind of like Pat um, on the prequels, and my dad had, like, the DVD box sets of all the Star Wars films, like mm. the originals. And there were many, many a summer where I would just kind of lie on his couch and watch those movies um, because he'd always be at work or he'd be busy or whatever. I'm fine now, by the way. Um, but I watched a lot of Star Wars and Star Trek growing up, like, a lot, and I rewatched them a lot. And it wasn't until I was about... 14 that i picked up i think it was revenge of the sith and i got about 10 minutes in and i went oh this isn't very good and like it was it was like i had like a it was like a literal light bulb moment i was like oh i don't 
I don't think this is a good story. Was this upon a rewatch? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this was, yeah. yeah. This was like I watched Same that thing film. Happened to me. I watched yes. that film like twenty times, and then it's one day I woke up and I was like, oh no, <laughs> um, and then I, I suddenly rewatched them all, and I was like, oh no. Um, and then that was kind of, it was one of my gateways into media criticism, I guess. Um, even though I don't like to credit George Lucas with Disney with anything because they don't need any more credit, but I probably wouldn't be doing this if I hadn't had that light bulb moment of like, oh, maybe this is bad. Mm. Um, so I have a complicated relationship with it. Uh, we saw Solo on opening night because Disney have this annoying habit of when it's not a huge release, they'll do the press screening at the same time as the, like the fan screening. So we went to a press screening with like people that had won like a radio competition to get tickets. The best kind. So there was like half of a theater filled with like diehard Star Wars fans and then half of a theater filled with like us and then a bunch of middle-aged people that write for like local papers. Um, So it was a very weird experience. I guess then to start today, I wanted to start with my unpopular thought, which is that I quite like the idea of the Star Wars prequels. It's always curious to see a storyteller continue to develop their thematic ideas and worlds in a confined space with an existing endpoint. They already know exactly where they're going and they're trying to fill in some blanks. It's a challenge a lot of authors and screenwriters are rarely up to. So, know that I'm not being sarcastic or glib. This is not a joke or a bit. I genuinely liked uh, Solo, A Star Wars Story, the first time I saw it in theaters. And I was the only one who did. Ben and Laura walked out with me and they were like, that was garbage. And I was, you can go back and you can listen to that podcast. I was glowing. It was my, I was so excited. There were space cowboys, Pat. I was, I was over the moon. Um, and they, I think I remember, yeah. Yeah, they, they kind of side-eyed me like I'd lost my fucking mind, which is fair. Um, and so while the next two episodes will be an exploration of the text, its origins and execution, it will also hopefully reveal whatever it was that made me enjoy this thing that's objectively pretty mediocre. So before we get into the pre-production and a bit of the background, do you guys know anything about the drama that went on in the making of this film? Yes. Okay, Pat does. Well, yeah, because you spent enough time with me. Mm -hmm. Pat's like, I've experienced several drunken rants. I wrote an article about that kind of thing. You did, which we'll get to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, do you know much about sort of some of the issues with how this all came together? I know nothing. The only thing I was aware of was when they were casting Han, and I don't really think that was a bit of drama, unless it was, and I'm just not aware of it, but... That's all I know. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. What, what was that drama? I just remember there was like a big thing about who they wanted to cast with his likeness. And there was um, a sort of unknown. I don't know if he was, I don't know if TikTok was around at that time, or maybe it was, I forget what the other app was that was kind Vine? of similar I think to TikTok. He was Vine, that doesn't yeah. exist anymore. Yeah. Vine. Yeah. Um, and this guy would make a bunch of vines and he looked exactly like. The actor's name, I'm blanking. Harrison Ford. So well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you look just like him. And I remember there was a whole thing about who are they going to cast? And then yeah. when um, the actual actor was cast, everybody was like, oh, that's a bit of a letdown. But I don't think that's what you're going to be talking about. Not exactly. But that is part of what we'll talk about in part two when it comes to the kinds of decisions they've made. Um, I'll, I'll link it in the show notes as a bit of a primer for next week. But Pat wrote a really great article about how complicated it is to be telling these prequel stories and and sort of having these actors come in and not just create a story, but also imitate someone else's performance. And it's it's one of those really tricky things where you're, I, I, if I recall the drama with the particular person you were talking about is that it's not just that he looked like Han Solo, but he did like a really good Han Solo impression. Mm-hmm. Like he was an impressionist, but he wasn't an actor. And so Disney were like, we're not going to just fucking hire some YouTube kid who doesn't know how to act. And then they hired um, Alden Ironreich, and then they went, fuck, we hired a YouTube kid who doesn't know how to act. Um, So there was some irony there, of course. But yeah, it it, look, that whole thing we will definitely be touching on in great detail in part two. I have like a whole two pages about it. Um, But yeah, it it is interesting, I suppose, for some context before we talk about everything. This film takes place between the events of the end of the prequel trilogy, and the start of the original trilogy. So between Revenge of the Sith and the start of A New Hope. Almost forgot what A New Hope was called just then, by the way. I was like, (laughs) oh, what's it? Episode, fuck, what is it? Um, uh, And then sometime before the events of Rogue One as well, um, is my understanding, (laughs) even though that's sort of not connected. And this was a real gamble for Disney because they were hoping that if this worked, they could just make these films every year and just print money. Hmm. That was their Hmm. plan. Um, Obviously, things did not go that way. So... Let's just jump. Let's just jump right in. It's no secret that Bob Iger's occupation of Disney has been profitable. 
From a series of safe purchases in Marvel to the Fox merger, and the even riskier investments like purchasing Maker, a YouTube network, Iger's leadership has seen the company make an awful lot of money, an awful lot of films, and make history with events like Infinity War and the relaunch of the Star Wars franchise to the big screen. But it was this latter decision that has had some varying results. Sometime in 2012, George Lucas started working on the Han Solo prequel he had always wanted to tell with the help of Lawrence Kasdan. Kasdan's resume speaks for itself. He wrote Raiders of the Lost Ark, The Empire Strikes Back, and he also penned Return of the Jedi. He did also write Dreamcatcher, um, which was impressively bad for an adaptation of a Stephen King film. So I will say that. It's not all... He's not just, he's not just printing winners. Every now and then he's, he's swinging and missing. Okay. Um, but, you know, he's the dude that did Empire, man. Like, that's the guy you get. That's the dude. If, if someone was like, yeah, we got a Star Wars idea, that's the guy I hire. I think, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. he's the dude. Um, so, you know, Lucas pushed Kasdan to develop this prequel film. Um, and it, it was complicated because this is where art and commerce kind of collide, where it was in part to basically show Disney that they had these bankable future films. So they could kind of hand them these treatments and be like, okay, like, here's four, you know, uh, prequel ideas. And, you know, one of them was like the, the Obi-Wan standalone series. Like they were sort of trying to give them like, not just a, instead of being like, here is a blank slate for Star Wars, go for it. They wanted to be like, here are some of Lucas's original ideas. Um, and, and it was never part of the contracts, but it was sort of in good faith to do that, I suppose. Um, and so they were kind of doing it for artistic reasons, but also, you know, with, with the future sale um, as part of that plan. This is the studio equivalent of redoing your bathrooms before putting your house on the market. It's not just that it increases the value of the Star Wars brand before sale, but it provides a sort of insulation for Disney. Having a series of outlined stories from the franchise's best creators essentially should future-proof the brand and the films. Um, Now, Lucas had met with uh, Iger in secret prior to anyone knowing about any of this quite a lot. Um, and on 30th of October, uh, 2012, Disney announced they would acquire Lucasfilm for $4 billion, which is an outrageous amount of money. Yeah. At around this time, Lucas asked Kazan to focus his efforts on The Force Awakens rather than the solo prequel. I couldn't find any document. I couldn't find any documentation around why they changed this plan. Um, if I had to speculate, the prequels are universally squinted at as being not great. So I think if Disney opened with, here's another prequel, they might have sort of been dead on arrival. Like you could imagine them being like, here is another prequel. And everyone would just be like, wow, that's how you want to reboot Star Wars? That's what we're doing? In hindsight, doing the doing the sequel trilogy was not the best idea either. But I, I kind of get the, the reticence to sort of um, to stick with the solo idea. So instead, with the help of J.J. Abrams after the departure of Mike, uh, after the departure of Michael Arndt, Kasdan and Abrams delivered The Force Awakens, a film that made more money than God. <laughs> at this this film made like a billion dollars, which is fucking wild to me. Wasn't it at a time uh, the most highest grossing film? It was. Yeah. Um. It it beat Jim Cameron's Avatar by like a hair. Yeah. Which is um, crazy. And then Jim Cameron's che- avatar caught back up. Because he cheats. Because he cheats. Yeah. Because he's a cheating liar. <laughs> and he cheating keeps republishing bastard. Titanic and, and, and Avatar. <laughs> and he's a cheating coward, that man. God damn. God damn. He is. Oh. Jim Cameron. I reckon I reckon he's still turning over in his grave about that. I reckon he's still saucy that, that Star Wars beat him. Wait, who is? Jim Cameron. In his grave. Well, he's not he's dead still yet. Alive. But, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> when was the last time he made something good? Yeah. I mean, yeah. good question. Yeah. I'm not saying I want to kill Jim. It doesn't matter. I, I just think <laughs> you should, they should stop like stop making Avatar. We get it. You're making five of them. It's fine. Nope. Relax. Yeah, we're getting five. We're it's, getting five. We got the we Avatar don't... land and Disney, you know. It, yeah, forever. exactly. Yeah. I forget you have, you're near Disneyland. So I'm like, oh yeah, you can, you can just go and check somewhat. out Avatar land. I, um, I'm somewhat close. I have checked it out. It is uh, interesting. It's beautiful. There's an Avatar just, land? Yeah, it's called uh, Pandora. What? Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Like the planet. Yeah. It, it. Unfortunately, when I was there, I didn't get to ride the penultimate ride. I forget what it's called. Um, but I did go on this like little river journey, and uh, it was uh, it was Avatar. You was know? it tranquil? <laughs> did you feel at peace? One with definitely nature. tranquil. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I've never seen Avatar. I don't plan on ever <laughs> seeing it. So it's kind of like, uh, yeah. I. You must right. be the only person in the world who would go to disney and their theme parks and not know half of the properties there <laughs> look i mean i used to like i like disney i like their animation stuff like 
a lot of like Marvel, Star Wars, Pandora, you know, I'm not mm. really into it. But, you know, that's just me. The, I'm not Mulan, like other Sign women. me the fuck up. I get it. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> um, did, did you guys see Force Awakens when it came out? I mean, I know that you did, Pat. Um, but Danielle, have you seen episode seven? I've seen it. I watched it. Um, I didn't see it when it came out. I watched it in preparation to see episode eight. Okay, cool. All right. So you guys kind of get the appeal, right? It was like a reset. It was Star Wars for a new generation. Kids loved it. Parents loved it. Us millennials were like, Star Wars is back, finally. And this time there's women in it, which was also exciting because um, it was sort of a, a significant issue with um, George and his approach to including people that aren't men. Um, there, was, there was a lot of, I think the main thing about its success was the amount of like romance, not not like romance, like love romance, but romanticism of like the past and shit. Yes. Practical effects, bringing back the old actors, mm -hmm. every uh, having the same plot as episode four. Just, yep. just like the, the safest fucking thing you could possibly do. Safest know? possible mm -hmm. movie. And yeah. it made a, a fuckload of money. And that is yeah. impressive to me. Mm. Um, yeah. And also, I, I I weep for our culture too. Yeah. Also, yeah. culture's dead, and we yeah. lost. But that's fine. That's why we do the show because we're trying to scrape Look, it back that, one week at a time. That's Disney. That's di that's Disney, baby. Um, I'm excited yeah. for when they own like our personhood. Hmm. Like when mm. I have to like go to Disney to request to like move flats. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when right. they own everything. I'm I'm excited for that. Oh, um, David, you haven't paid your taxes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wait for that check oh, otherwise something will happen to you in a dark alley oh. um that was a very silly bit i enjoyed that um i was gonna say something important there but now all i'm thinking about is like mickey, mickey mouse threatening you yeah well yeah. i'm thinking about like turning into a dark alley and then just like seeing the shadowed silhouette of like the oh, two ears yeah the and, like a baseball bat <laughs> oh very good Oh, Mickey's ruthless. Mickey's ruthless. Now, during this time, uh, Kasdan handed off the solo project, um, which it had a code name, but I, I couldn't find what that code name was, um, to his son, John Kasdan. Now, uh, um, so... Yeah, writing talent stays in the family. It's it's, uh, it's genetic. Yeah, it's genetic. Yeah, if I have a kid, they're also going to be pretty okay, right? Yeah. yeah. Is that how, that's how that works? Uh, yeah, I'm, pre yeah, I'm pretty sure. That is how it works. I'm not a scientist, Pat. Um, <laughs> similar to his father, John had worked on critically acclaimed shows. Uh, he wrote a lot of Freaks and Geeks episodes, which is a fucking great TV show. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. But, <laughs> so I love Freaks and Geeks. It's one of my favorite TV, sh TV shows of all time. It's like my comfort food TV mm -hmm. show. It's one of those like things I watch when I go through a bad breakup. Um, but John has had an interesting career. So unlike um, Kaz Daddy Kasdan, Kasdan, Kasdan Sr. Um, Kasdan Jr. sort of didn't have the luxury of having like a huge success under his belt. Like when when Papa Kasdan printed Empire, he suddenly, like he, he was bona fide forever. Like that's the equivalent of like, um, I'm trying to think of like another equivalent in the movie space. Um, what's a screenplay that's like, that, that everyone universally agrees is like, I mean, like Shawshank Redemption or something. Uh, yeah you like any nolan script any nolan script yeah. um except tenet jurassic pretty park. much yeah. um jurassic park is a good one um any nolan script except this the first dark half knight of inception rises. and the dark knight rises um mm -hmm. but like oh, actually no you know what yeah like memento or something is a really good example yeah this basically solidified um kasin senior's bona fides the problem with kasin jr is he didn't really have like that hit or like that thing freaks and geeks is universally acclaimed but it's not it didn't make millions and millions of dollars. The only previous kind of thing he'd done of note was a film called In the Land of Women. Um, I'm just going to give you the pitch of the movie In the Land of Women. So In the Land of Women, and I watched it for research for this, and I do not encourage you to do that. Um, oh, no. <laughs> in the Land of Women is a very early 2000s movie about a writer in LA who heads home to take care of his sick grandmother. He ends up falling for his neighbor, who is married, and also ends up embroiled in a romance with the neighbor's teenage daughter. The story resolves weirdly, and it has a tendency where all of the women in the narrative are utilities for the protagonist to grow and change. Even, even carrying the marks of its time, John's work does have precision and flair. More often than not, the acting fails the script, and I ended up reading the screenplay afterwards because I could tell that there was really good stuff in there, just the direction and the execution wasn't there. So if you ignore all the sexist stuff and like how weird it is that 
he's he's in like a relationship with the neighbor's underage daughter and then also the neighbor who's married it's real fucking weird um but like the the dialogue and the character work is pretty solid right um yeah it's just yeah, well, don't he was go in back. that movie they're no, notable stars in no it? one famous it was like a b okay. kind of b-grade hollywood rom-com so do, you, um, do okay. you think his attitude toward that was like they fucked my script up like it could have been a masterpiece <laughs> no i just don't think he knew any better i think okay. yeah I, I don't think so i it, i don't get the impression reading any, anything he said about it that that he penned that script and then walked away and then went oh my god they've ruined my masterpiece i think he went they've done my masterpiece Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of the impression I get. Um, and so, you know, when it, in early 2016, when it came time to choose directors for Solo, um, Disney were looking for directors who could deliver John Kasdan's finished script competently. So one of the things they were keen on was like making sure that when you pick up the pages of his script, this bouncy dialogue, this kind of crisp kind of precision is, is brought to fruition. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things he did well is that if, if you read exactly what's in his scripts, and you put that on a on on camera, it's gonna work. And that's the that's that's why you hire John. It's like he he gives you everything you need. Um, he's sort of he's the equivalent of Edgar Wright, where you know when Edgar Wright pens a script, he's like putting in like okay, this is the this is how the music will syncopate to this song. This is where the the four hundred eight kick will come in. Like that detail is what John is doing, but for dialogue and for body movement and for blocking. Um, and so at the time, Disney was in the midst of a groundswell of very safe films, like we've said. So they went with directors who had been widely successful, but who hadn't really done anything too artsy, right? Um, Obviously, James Gunn is the obvious outlier, um, but they gave him Guardians, which was a relatively obscure property at the time. So if he failed, it was pretty safe. Like, it's kind of like when they did Iron Man. Like, everybody out here pretending like they knew who the fuck Iron Man was before that movie came (laughs) out. But, like, nobody knew who the fuck Iron Man was. He wasn't even the biggest Avenger. Like... He was fucking nobody. He was just like a B character. Captain America was the guy. So they, you start with the safe thing in case you fail, right? right? So they test, they test James Gunn and they go, people fucking love Guardians. We're onto something here. We could be a bit, bit more experimental. So ultimately, Kathleen Kennedy and the board settled on Phil Lord and Christopher Miller, a duo who had found huge success in Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs and the once thought impossible adaptation, The Lego Movie. They also did one of my favorite films of all time, 21 Jump mm-hmm. Street. Do you even know the Miranda rights? Yes. What's here on that? <laughs> we, we, you got a lot of stuff to do. Oh, you go ahead. Got a lot you going anywhere, Schmidt? You we got time? I had a thing, but I could probably push it back. Go ahead. It's four declamatory sentences followed by a question for a total of 57 words. Okay. Uh, it's, look, it obviously starts with you have the right to remain silent. I know you've heard this before. And, and then um, it, it, I think it sounds something like... Uh, well, the thing, the th- yeah, you, oh, right. You have the right to remain an attorney. Did you say that you have the right to be an attorney? You do have the right to be an attorney if you want to. Where were you? <clears throat> I was. Uh, I was chasing my perp, sir. Nice. That film is so fucking yes. good. Um, and so it seemed like a safe bet to bring them out. Uh, uh, to bring them on under Kathleen Kennedy's admittedly waning pathos for the solo project. I'll tell you some stuff and then I'll qualify what I'm going to say. So it's probably worth noting before we go ahead that they were a great choice. Um, Miller and Lord were a great choice. They'd made child-friendly projects in Cloudy and the Lego movie, but proved they could skew adult with Jump Street. They're kind of like a really perfect fit. Um, And given Star Wars lands squarely in the middle, this is like honestly an inspired choice, in my opinion. Uh, Principal photography began on the 30th of January, 2017. And by June the same year, the film had spent... 54.5 54.5 million on production and lost both of its directors. So we're going to kind of talk about what happened. Um, okay, so it's weird how what Disney wanted was precision in their directing, mm-hmm. and uh, they thought Chris Lord and uh, Chris Miller and Phil Lord is that their names? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they 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 couldn't deliver on that premise, uh, which is so strange because the film they worked on after this, Into the Spider Verse, is razor sharp yep. in its precision in yeah. uh, storytelling it is like it, it, and the thing is like it's animation too so they probably had that uh that freedom to make it razor sharp and it, i don't know it's just a weird juxtaposition from mm-hmm. what you hear from what they did on the set of solo which was a lot of improvis improvisation improvisation yep so yeah i don't like you know you know it's just some weird circumstances like <laughs> we'll get to it i think that's the bit we're going to talk about next i, I think 
the way that it was reported on was wholly inaccurate in a lot of ways. Mm. So I've done a lot of digging and, and this is one of the issues with some, sometimes on the show, when I'm trying to construct these narratives, there are these spots where all you've got is conjecture from different people with different motivations to say different things. Mm. So when Disney were like, oh, they were too loosey goosey on set. I doesn't seem to me to be the reason they got rid of them. Mm. doesn't seem to be the reason, but you're right. It is a stark contrast to how, how obnoxiously precise and perfect like to a to a second, Spider Verse is yeah. In comparison to uh, what they describe the set of Solo looking like, mm. um, I've never I've never th- thought to question that uh, the news might be lying. But y- y- now that you said uh, that, it makes sense. <laughs> it may, totally makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, Lord and Miller are obviously competent at their jobs, uh, but Kennedy's pathos was, and this is where we'll start to get into some of the issues here. The way that she talks about Star Wars to me is fascinating. So she talked about at the time that their number one priority is quote protecting these characters end quote when talking about star wars it's not telling good stories it's not making money it's protecting these characters Mm -hmm. specifically the characters that you grew up loving because they're so afraid that if they fuck it up and that god forbid they make one of the main characters after 20 years of in in story in universe story time change somehow um, for instance, maybe he goes from being like this really competent, cool sword fighter to being an old man because it's been 20 years, just like as an abstract example. People might get mad. And so they were terrified of this. They, they, were, they were terrified that if, if Kennedy didn't do everything in her power to kind of keep Luke, Han, and Leia as protected as possible, then people were going to start hating Star Wars. And if they hate Star Wars, they're not going to buy tickets. And if they don't buy tickets, then it's a waste of money and she gets fired. Mm. So she's in this mm. awkward position where... She can either choose to go out and make really good art or she can choose to do what she did and what, what she's doing, which is like defend the status quo. Um, well, I imagine uh, her motivation for doing so was the, the feedback that she sees are from the vehement fans. Yes. Which uh, obviously that's the only feedback you're going to see is people yelling the loudest. Yeah. And all, those people that are yelling the loudest, you know, like have maybe not the best uh, views of Star Wars or like the best intentions. Um, Mm -hmm. What they want isn't necessarily representative of what people who like good stories want. Correct. Yes. They Mm. they have an idea in their heads of what they think it should be, but that has no material relationship to how stories work Mm. or what good stories look like or how to tell a good story or even just like, like basic things like people change over time. That is like such an obvious, like, but they were like, I don't know. We wanted to see young, cool Luke, Mm. not, not a Luke who, you know, is on the other side of the hill who is grappling with his decisions like a person does when they get older. Like, even that right. stuff is is so transparent to me where it's like, it. her fears, turns out, were realized when they made The Last Jedi. And we'll kind of talk about that because that drops just before this comes out. So she, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. So Kennedy describes her primary goal as protecting the characters and the intellectual property here. As the occupation of Lucasfilm's production has gone on, it's clear this is not the whole story. Uh, She says protect, not grow or evolve or challenge, but protect. Really what Kennedy specializes in is taking scripts vetted by Lucasfilm and Disney and ensuring projects never take risks with these scripts. From The Force Awakens to Rebels to Elements of The Last Jedi that didn't go far enough, the material surrounding Solo speaks volumes about her goal. So while we have no confirmation of just how much Kennedy directly impacted the filming itself, it seems reasonable to assume she was playing the role of an interlocutor between Kazan's vision and Lord and Miller. She was kind of the go-to middleman. And this was her role on The Force Awakens with Abrams, so I'm pretty confident making that logical leap, even though there's no documentation around it. Now, Lord and Miller saw the chemistry in their cast and increasingly relied on improvisation between story beats to flesh out the world and these characters. From everything I've read, the cast really liked working with Lord and Miller, but this created some friction with Disney. See, you can do some improv and freehand, but Disney have invested a tremendous amount of resources in ensuring their new Star Wars maintains consistent canon and rules, with varying success. There's a lot of... They, they, they stopped caring about it after The Force Awakens um, because of how bad uh, people received The Last Jedi, so that there are some... We'll unpick it in a second when we talk about like how this, this film kind of approached release. But like the improvisation on another film is usually possible because you're not dealing with a universe where like like th- there are certain things you can't say in Star Wars. Like snakes don't exist in Star Wars. You can't say you can't reference snakes, right? Or bananas. So like obvious sayings and like colloquialisms and like there are certain things you just can't do. So 
like whilst improv like improvisation is good and like you need it that you're also hitting that barrier of like this is a world with rules and like stuff that matters that you have to think about mm. and be conscious of right. and so um the risk of letting lord and miller run the budget up by doing great character work is that if it contradicts with the other movies or extended universe it's basically unusable so they can have these great scenes where they've spent you know a week of principal photography doing like amazing you know character work but if you know, Han says something that he shouldn't be able to say or that doesn't exist in this universe or uses grammar that shouldn't happen. You have to throw it out and it's a waste of money and you've spent, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on on a, a unusable piece of content. And so in an effort to meet in the middle, uh, Kennedy summoned Big Daddy, Lawrence Kasdan, from the writer's room and put him on a plane. So they're sending in uh, Kasdan Sr. Kennedy's decision to send Lawrence Kasdan to the London set was, in my opinion, the nail in the coffin of this production. The two directors felt his presence ended up being more of a shadow director, with Kazan demanding certain scenes be filmed line for line as per the script, complaining the film was too funny. Um, and keep in mind, like, Kazan, like, Kazan Senior, he's the guy, right? He's used to being the writer and the director. He's used to Lucas giving him a lot of freedom. Um, and suddenly, suddenly he's arguing with these two young kids who, like, uh, a funny and who the cast love and who everybody in the production seems to be a huge fan of. And he's been thrown in as this hired gun by Kennedy to just like meddle. And mm. so it creates this friction and this like gross tension on the set. And everything I've read from that time, like makes it sound really uncomfortable where everybody is like this copacetic family working toward this vision. And then you have Kasdan kind of in the background being like, no, like don't do that. You can't do that. You should do it this way. Um, and so obviously that's going to create increasing problems. And so this is the most puzzling part of the whole production to me um, because during pre-production, Lucasfilm like didn't consider Ka like either Kasdan for directing. So like, I don't, th this is where I'm confused. I'm like, okay, if, if you have this script and you want it done that way, why wouldn't you hire either of the Kasdans to do it? Like it's such an, it's such a weird, like if, if you want someone who's, who's famous for precision in these crackling scripts, you get one of the two Kasdans who have done that their entire careers. Did Ju Kasdan Jr. direct that film we were talking about earlier? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. they are, so they're both of them are directors? Like, yeah. Okay. Um, Not just I, writers. In my opinion, Kasdan Jr. is a slightly better director. Okay. Um, but that's more a matter of taste, I think. Because his, his, because so Lucas's relationship with him is interesting. They, they're kind of like, um, what's the guy they're, they're like the equivalent of like jeff johns and jim lee at dc mm. like well like even though jim lee does like a lot of the writing like jeff johns is the creative kind of force and they're partnered in that process um so that's kind of the impression i get of their relationship um on a lot of the the star wars after a new hope um but i guess like as a reminder um this is uh like these are the star wars guys and we may never know why kennedy and the board went with lord and miller in the first place um, but it's clear that their anxiety over the film was increasing every day of shooting. Crucially, though, with Kasdan on set, Kennedy, Kennedy and her board had a direct line to production. They, basically, they had like an inside man, right? They had like a spy, basically. <laughs> um, now, their concerns were no longer baseless anxiety, but visible every day, right? Lord and Miller continued to forge a unique, punchy, funny Star Wars space western, and Disney quietly seethed in the background. Eventually, after weeks of Kazan interfering, Lord and Miller refused to compromise. Now, before we kind of talk about what happens next, no one is quite sure what exactly was the straw that broke the camel's back. Disney had been very tight-lipped about it. Um, no one's really... Like, they, they'd finished, like, three quarters of principal photography at this point. Like, they've done... The film is essentially finished. Um, so the theory is that... Because the, one of the ways that you construct films is, like, you do a lot of the the kind of cheapest stuff at the start because you know that you can reshoot it later in different parts of principal photography and you do a lot of the expensive stunts or like kind of practical effects heavy stuff somewhere toward the middle and end so the biggest theory is like maybe maybe they were improvising too much with that part of the production where it's a lot of money at a, at a very like short amount of time mm. and i think that's probably if i had to speculate just reading between the lines it seems like that's what's most likely happened um I would give a lot of money to know which suggestion did break the camel's back, but regardless, the directors departed the project under a shadow, despite having finished three quarters of the film. On this, Kennedy said, quote, I just say over and over again that yes, it was an incredibly difficult decision that we had to make, and obviously it was pretty late in the game, which shows we spent a lot of time trying not to have to make that decision. 
I think both Chris and Phil are enormously talented and incredibly funny. And when all this came together, all of us wanted nothing more than to have this be an incredible working experience. And when it was not working out as we all, as we had all hoped, it wasn't out of lack of talent. End quote. I mean, like, you know, that doesn't sound as... It doesn't sound very um, hateful. No. And, you know, like, I, I think... I'd like to think that they were sort of professional about that. You know, they were like, look, we, we made a mistake hiring you guys. You, you know, like we wanted a certain product and you guys delivered us another product. That's mm -hmm. no one's fault per se, but like, we're just going to have to fire you. I'd like to think it went down I'd that like way. To think, yeah, um, I'd like to think, yeah, I'd like to think that as well. I, but probably not. Yeah, everything I know about Kennedy suggests that's probably not what happened. Um, yeah, and, and, and so you're left three quarters of a film, uh, three quarters of the film's principal photography is done. You've spent fifty million dollars, um, and you no longer have directors. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a scary position to put yourself in, um, and you yeah. have approximately mm, eighteen months till this film is supposed to come out. So also running out of time. Oh my god! Yeah. yeah. Um, so what happens next? Well, on extremely short notice, the project needed someone talented, safe, who had the ability to salvage a film from the misshapen mess Kennedy's lack of oversight and Katzen's meddling had forced it into. So they got the guy who voices Arrested Development, who also happens to be world-famous director Ron Howard. Oh, he's the narrator? I never yeah. knew that. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. That's so yeah. funny. Yeah. Uh, now, Ron Howard, for the youngsters listening, is one of the most reliable, competent directors out there. Uh, Howard directed Apollo 13, Cinderella Man, The Da Vinci Code, and many more famous films that are just totally fine and not particularly special. To say that Howard's style is safe is underappreciating how good he is at what he does. Is that your cat? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> she, she will not leave me alone. Oh, and kitty. Uh, do you want to be held? You acted like you wanted to be held. <laughs> She's okay. like, no, this isn't what I wanted. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to leave you there then. <laughs> All right, sorry. <laughs> Continue. Uh, to say that Howard's style is safe is underappreciating how good he is at what he does. I think we as media critics sometimes have a habit of putting experimental and unique directors above all others. They drive the culture forward. They challenge assumptions. But the truth is, someone needs to direct to this year's rom-coms and dumb action films. The industry does need Howards and Bays to keep the wheels turning. Uh, and so Ron Howard was a natural choice. Uh, wait, uh, Danielle, have you seen any of uh, Howard's work? Uh, well, I've seen him in Happy Days, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> directing? Um... None of the movies that you mentioned I've seen, so mm -hmm. I and I can't think of any off the top of my head. I mean, other than I get not directing stuff. I've seen him in Arrested Development, mm -hmm. obviously. But um, what are some other movies he's directed? Do you know of any off the top of your head? <sighs> this is exactly my point. It's a lot of like mediocre <laughs> kind of B grade, like none that you well, would be like, oh yeah, that film. The only reason I know Cinderella Man is because I've seen it so many times, and The Da Vinci Code because it was contentious when it came out because the books mm. aren't good um yeah <laughs> yeah so like that's exactly my point i guess is that howard mm -hmm. is not a guy who you point to you know he's not like a um he's not like a nolan or a like he, he's not these these luminaries he doesn't walk around with this ability like he's not taika watiti like no one's getting him in as the as one of the most talented like you know guns with a really unique voice he's the, just a guy that makes films there's a joke in rick and morty where like jerry really likes ron howard um <laughs> just speaking more to how pathetic he is <laughs> like, which is great <laughs> That's I mean, <laughs> fucking incredible. Yeah. <laughs> he also recently directed the movie um Hill Hillbilly Elegy, which I've heard like very bad things about. Okay. Um, and I've no interest in seeing. Um, and I know people kind of acted like that was this kind of big thing for American politics. Um, and they're acting like, oh, he's like really an edgy director. And I'm like, is he though? I'm not quite sure about that. I don't think he is. Um, yeah, I think he might be the safest man to ever walk the face of the earth. Mm. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I mean, Bryce Dallas Howard is quite quite an experimental director. She's great. Like, um, his daughter is yeah. fantastic. But um, he, yeah. I, I always forget that she's his It's daughter. so weird, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I know. She's yeah. directed some Mandalorian episodes. I yeah. Think. Yeah. She's, dude, she's so good. Yeah. Um, and so, like, you know, further proof that good writing and storytelling is genetic, apparently. Yeah. yeah. Right, exactly. Disney, you're onto it. Um, like maybe that's the trick. It's just, like... Oh no! Maybe they'll breed like a Disney master race. Maybe they've already uh, perfected the human genome project, and they, they're just like pumping out. That's possible. Creative people, yeah. They also have the cure for the common cold somewhere. <laughs> I imagine. Um, <laughs> but look, so so you know, Howard is a natural choice, right? 
Um, he has no particular interest in continuing Lord and Miller's vision um, and was just... Uh, and he, he just made the film they wanted, or he tried to. It was hard um, with what was left. And the film itself, we'll talk about it next episode um, in, in great depth, as we always do in our part twos. Um, but I guess before we get to that, like one thing that's really important to understand is that when they approached reshoots of principal photography here, it was immediately afterwards. So a lot of the problems that these big pictures have, so like the Fan 4 stick movie is a good example, um, where they basically, um, they fired Josh Brolin like toward the end of the production. And then six months later, they picked up principal photography again. Everybody had like slightly different wigs and slightly different haircuts. They did their best, but you could tell that they were reshoots. Sorry, they fired who? Uh, the director? Josh Brolin, the director, yeah. Josh Brolin's an actor. He, no, they hired, they fired... Not Josh Brolin. Uh, the guy who was going to do episode nine originally, right? Yeah, yeah. not Josh Brolin. It's something. Josh, Josh Trank. Josh Trank, yeah. I knew it was a Josh. Um, Josh Trank, rather. Um, and, you know, it, it ended up being a pretty train wreck of a film there's no, there's no way of us knowing that if that it might have been bad if we just got his version that's also possible i'm not i'm not saying that isn't but those kinds of decisions usually like there's then a stop gap where you then come back and you can do principal photography you've had time and the reason they do that is you can go back and do new treatments of your script and look at what you have and then write in new scenes they didn't have that it was like literally two weeks later howard was on set um they got lucky he was free right um there's a conspiracy theory that maybe kennedy had been like teeing him up a few months ahead like in case, um, probably, and that's what I'd be doing if I was if I was watching, you know, it's like the trolley problem. If you're at the very far end and you can see the trolley problem coming, I'd be looking for a third option as well. Look, if if you're a cutthroat businesswoman, that's the smart thing to do. She's very good at her job, yeah. so she's teed this up True. maybe in the background. We have no idea of knowing, but then he basically hits the ground running and starts shooting. So one of the advantages this film has over a lot of others that go through these kind of kinds of reshoots is that, like. The reshoots are happening immediately afterwards. The actors look the same. They're on the same sets with the same costumes, right? They don't have the Justice League problem where you can see like Ben Affleck, uh, Ben Affleck's like rehab in the reshoots, but you beforehand he looks fine. Like there's none of that noticeable difference or noticeable like different wigs or, or costumes or whatever. So I think when we talk about it next episode, I just wanted like us to keep in mind going into it that Howard did his best, um, but what he did was so antithetical to the choices that Lord and Miller were making that the film almost feels like at times, not like it's coming apart at the seams like Justice League was, but almost like he sort of got like a smudge tool in Photoshop and was just like, we can smear <laughs> across it. It's got like this Vaseline across it where it's right. like, it, it kind yeah. of, it's like, if you don't look too hard, it seems fine. That's how this film feels to me. So yeah. join us. It's a great way of explaining it, actually. Yeah, yeah it really. It's just, it's, yeah. yeah it, but kind of in the same way, it's like, it, it's, it's like a bowl of fruit salad with cling wrap wrapped too tight over the top, right? <laughs> it's so tight. And when you look at it, you can't see the cling wrap, but you go to dig in with a spoon and it bounces off. <laughs> That's kind of this film to me. Um, so true. Yeah. yeah. I could do a, do you want another food one? Sure. If you, I'd, <laughs> Surprised you got more in you. Solo is kind of like a, it's like a, a soup. It's like a soup before the meal, mm -hmm. and they bring out the soup, but they don't bring out any bread. Oh. And you know something's missing, but you're not quite sure what. And the soup <laughs> is good, but it's not really what you're there for. It's not the main attraction, but you also kind of know something's missing. It's like too watery to be substantial. Yeah, yeah. but because mm. you don't have any carbs with it, because the bread's missing, you don't realize the mm. bread's missing. You just kind of feel wanting, and you get to the main course, and you're already a little bit full because you had too <laughs> right. much soup, and no one wants soup. Yeah, right. Yeah. There right, you go. Right. We just did what we should never do, which is use ill-fitting food analogies for media criticism. Mm -hmm. So on that <laughs> note, join us next time as we strap on our blasters and get Space Cowboy with our analysis of Solo, a Star Wars story. That's part one, baby. It's a bit of a shorter one. It's a bit of a shorter one. Um, how are you guys feeling about it? Wait, it what, what's, what, <laughs> given all of that, what's, does it change your mind about anything? Um, actually, yeah, it does. It makes me a bit more sympathetic to the... To um, like I hate to say this, but to the business side of things, right. to, um, because Solo, I mean, Star Wars in general has always been a property that has had like a more solemn tone, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and when I saw Episode Eight and they kind of had that Marvel, those Marvel quips to it, it it jarred me. It it was jarring in a way, yeah. Um, where I was like, this isn't Star Wars. So I completely understand. Not compl you know, I'm more, I'm more sympathetic to them wanting to get rid of the tone that Phil Lord and Chris Miller were putting into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's good because my goal here was to build up that expectation and then completely ruin it next week. Yeah, cool. So get excited. I'm going to break your heart again. <laughs> this is good. I, I like this. Um, Danielle, what, what do you think about all that, given that that's all fresh for you? That's all new. It, it actually kind of, 
the pieces are somewhat fitting together because as I was watching it, there were certain themes, which we'll get into next episode, like that I noticed were sort of left just unfinished or mm -hmm. like plot points, things where they could have made connections and they're just not made. And I don't know if that's because of, you know, with Ron Howard and everything going on, or I'd like to see like what specifically was affected by that, like which plot points and stuff mm -hmm. and character beats. Um, because there were definitely things lacking, and now I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. Okay, mm. and it's gonna it's really hard to pick them apart because as I was saying, like there's no visual difference between the way that it was like the actual camera work is the same. Um, I, there are some shots I can definitely tell are Howard's. I think when we get to it next week, um, uh, Rybold, who's going to be one of our guests, he's got a really good eye for this stuff, um, and so he might have some some interesting insights for us as far as like, oh, you know, that thing was missed because like, it was being set up in this. Miller shot, but then was dropped in that Howard shot later. Um, things like that. He's he's got a really good eye for. Um, so I'm I'm keen to get into it. I guess I'm left kind of in the same boat as Pat, where I I, I empathize with the business choices, and I get that they were between a rock and a hard place. Um, but also, Disney owns most of everything now, and if they don't take artistic risks, then we like culture's over, and we keep losing. And people like, do you know, like it's, I'm on, I'm, I'm on both sides of it where I'm like, the reason we do the publication we do is because places like that exist and they're making choices like this, but I also get why they make them. Hmm. And that's complicated. I don't want to like throw shade on them for making these choices, but at a certain point, you know, Disney, there's a great quote from Iger from forever ago, where he's talking about like, you know, um, Disney's goal is to make money and make history. And if they do that, invariably, they will make good art. Good art is a byproduct, not the focus. Is, is that Iger or is that um, his predecessor? I'm, I'm forgetting his name. Um, Michael Eisner. It might have been Eisner, actually. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. The reason I say is because Iger, I mean, Iger might have said it. He literally worked directly under Eisner. Um, Eisner literally no, brought it, him up. It might have so, been Eisner. And then he's taken on that path, that pathos. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, well, yeah. that's a very naive outlook, I think. <laughs> it is. Think that. I, yeah. 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 Well, look, we'll, we'll, we'll come back next week with, with a full house and, and a, a full deep dive analysis. Uh, look, I, the only things that I wanted to flag is that we've relaunched our Patreon. Um, so you can go to patreon.com slash zero indent. Um, it's finally up and running. Uh, there's three different tiers of rewards. You can get all kinds of goodies. Um, we're going to be recording our first kind of Patreon only podcast directly after this. Um, it's just like we're going to get together we're going to chat about like media criticism stuff we like we're going to answer some uh, some audience questions um, so if you want to ask us any of those questions um, jump in there get some of those rewards you can head to patreon.com slash zero indent if you want to read any of the other stuff we publish um, Pat has a great article that I recommend you read as a primer for next week um, go to zero indent.com uh, and it is called deep in the fakes it is a great exploration of the concept of imitation versus creation um, so I highly recommend you check that out uh, Danielle, do you have anything that you want to plug on your end? Um, nothing new at the moment, but uh, just be sure to check out Level Story. New issues of the magazine will be coming mm -hmm. out this year and a bunch of uh, hopefully new content um, on top of the magazine. And that's levelstory.net. Go check it out. There's a few articles I've written about The Last of Us and a few other bits and bobs. Uh, we mm -hmm. did that great. One of my favorite podcasts I've ever done is that retrospective Last of Us recording. Um, yes. which is very fun. You get, you get to hear about seven um, media critics in a room together arguing about <laughs> The Last of Us. It's one of my favorite things. Oh, yeah. Uh, Pat, what, what, where can people, what, what should they check out? Where can they find you? Um, so I am the co-host of a film philosophy analysis podcast called A Method to the Madness. I uh, run it with my co-host, Mitchie. Um, if you like films, if you like Wisecrack and their Show Me the Meaning podcast, it's pretty much that. Yeah. So yeah, go check it out. If you like what we do, you'll like it. It's part of the network. It's a great time. Go check it out. Mm -hmm. um, that's all I got. Oh, also, go buy my book at maynardtrick.com. If, if you like the kinds of stories we tell and the way we tell them, chances are you'll like that novel. Uh, book two is out. So you can go and grab yourself a copy of book two. Um, we'll be doing a director's commentary at some point soon. I just haven't teed that up. Um, otherwise... Check us out on all the socials. You guys know what to do. Do the ratings, all that stuff. Um, and yeah, let us know. Like, reach out. Let us know what you think of Solo, what you thought of this. Coming into it, I'd love to know your opinions of the film before next week. Um, if you have anything really interesting to say, we might include it as part of the, the breakdown. Uh, very, very excited. 
thanks for listening or watching, however you can see in this. Um, and thank you to Cameron who watches this on 2.5 speed. I found that out the other day. 2.5? Um, yeah, which wow. is impressive. Um, so I'm not firing on high <laughs> enough neurons for that. Yeah, damn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I hope, I, hope, I hope you also enjoyed. Um, thanks, everybody. And thanks to our Patreon supporters. We'll catch you guys uh, next week. Or if you're a Patreon, we'll see you on the Patreon-only episode. Thanks for watching this episode of Too Much Cowboy. You have our patrons to thank for this series. Big shout outs to Cameron and Yoop Kumans, our top Patreon supporters. You can join them by heading to patreon.com slash zero indent and contributing to our independent media publication. If you'd like to see more from us or more of this show and you're listening on the Too Much Cowboy podcast feed, you can either head to youtube.com slash zero indent or look up Backtrack behind the creators wherever you find your podcasts to listen to more.